Morning, Tony. Morning, John. Very nice to interview you here in uh, beautiful Washington. Tony, I, I, the purpose of this uh, interview is just to to allow you to be exposed, if you like, in your personality, your person to uh, uh, everybody. Uh, they, they know, of course, your, what you're doing and your work and all the rest of it. But I think they'd probably like to get to know you a little bit better. Okay, so if we start at the beginning, tell us where you're from and uh, where you went to school and university, etc. Well, John, I was born in Melbourne. Um, I'm of Irish descent, clearly from a very similar background and stable to yours. Uh, my father is uh, still alive, he's 92, he still sees patients, he, he's a general practitioner. My mother had eight children, so she was the homemaker. And we had our, I grew up in a general practice which was in our house. So medicine was sort of like what we were immersed in from the get-go. My father had been an Air Force, Australian Air Force pilot and a doctor, so we spent a lot of time looking at aeroplanes taking taking off and landing with him, but um, medicine was really the only only um, profession or career I ever as aspired to. So there was never going to be anything else other than medicine? It was ingrained in you, as it were? It was ingrained. We, As a result of that, four of my brothers are doctors, mm. and uh, the other two failures, one's a judge and one teaches at the Jesuit High School, so they were considered a little subpar. Medicine was the only career right. for us. So right from the start, and we were, he, he was a very um, uh, kind general practitioner and, and fairly impoverished, I must say, and um, medicine and scholastic achievement was his primary focus and service. Mm. So, mm. so did, university in Melbourne? or, or... Yeah, we all, we all went to the University of Melbourne. Again, we were, that was the only university, or our other universities, but he was very keen on that. So I went to the University of Melbourne and lived in the college there, in the Newman College. Mm -hmm. I'm a Jesuit educated guy and spent... So uh, that's, a, that's a snap here as well. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a very traditional... I yeah. uh, went to the Jesuit high school called Xavier uh, College and then to the university and to Newman College. And then I was um, a resident at St Vincent's in Melbourne, mm. where, I was, where I was actually born at St Vincent's mm. uh, and uh, worked with in... in uh, the, with the nuns there at St Vincent's and was there for a long time. So you were in St Vincent's and then we caught up with each other in London where yep. you were going to obviously do a fellowship yep. there and uh, tell us who you worked with there okay. and, and, and what I did my then. surgery training in Melbourne and then in those days it was not very structured so I went to did a fellowship at MD Anderson in Houston with a legendary firebrand called Dr Douglas Johnson who really taught me the principles of surgical oncology. So he was really one of the kings of. He surgery, was with uh, with uh, Dr. Whitmore and, and Johnson were the two real doyens yeah. of urologic oncology, and it really uh, made my career. I think he was uh, such a, a great teacher and mm. such a perfectionist. We did. I know. I, I know at Anderson when I was there that we did 500 straight cystectomies, and that's in the early 80s, with no ah. no mortality, yeah. not one death. So he set a very high uh, expectation, but whilst I was there, I invited. Uh, he were allowed to invite a visiting professor each. We had three fellows, two Americans and myself, and uh, so I suggested to bring an Englishman. And he that was rather an affront to a Texan, <laughs> but he he was very good about it. So he he um, then invited John Blandy to come as visiting professor. And I remember being sent out to Houston Intercontinental to pick him up, and I'd never seen him, but I'd read his books. He was such a terrific writer. Mm that I loved his teaching and then uh, so I said well how do I how do I recognize him he said the chief said well you're the only one that speaks English and uh, so I went out to the Houston Intercontinental this guy a little fellow in a navy blue pinstripe suit was stood out dramatically against guys in blue jeans and uh, 10 gallon hats so it was easy to pick him and then from there he offered me a job to come to London that's where I met you mm -hmm. yeah and I worked at the London Hospital uh, and did everything from transplant to oncology. Remind me who who the other SPRs in, in Richard London. Tiptoff was Richard, yeah. two of us, and uh, right. we worked very hard. Richard, Richard and I remained very good friends. Yeah. And uh, then I was introduced to the Chrysalis Club. Yeah, that's where I met you. Yeah, it's brilliant. And at that time there was Abrams and Mundy. Uh, neither, neither of whom came to the Christmas Club. Well, that's right, I met them. Uh, <coughs> Is that right? Yeah, I met them. Because Monday, Monday was not a great attender at that. Well, I, uh, 
Uh, they were about. They certainly were in the pub afterwards. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, um, and, the, and the Chris Woodhouse was in it. Yes. Uh, so that's where I made all yeah. my English yeah. Yeah. and Bowers contacts. Yeah. It was fabulous. The training, obviously, with Johnson was intense oncological practice. With Landy, it was more general urology. Absolutely. And, uh, he, I know, was obviously interested also in reconstructive uh, uh, practices and uh, the Blandy urethroplasty. Do you see him at all now? Or? Yes, I do. Yeah. I had uh, lunch with him uh, end of 2010. Did you know? He's, yeah. uh, I took him to lunch and with Anne, his wife, and he's in, still in good health and yeah. he's still active with uh, uh, curating, I think, the college, the college yeah. and uh, painting. Okay, so so that was that was the training end of things, and uh, obviously that was uh, uh, terrific. And then you went back to Oz. I went back to Australia, and um, at that time in Australia, there was very little opportunity for people who were interested in more than just private practice. Really, so mm. it was a private practice and some public hospital commitment, but there was no academic practice. And so I, st uh, I actually left practice in Melbourne after five years and went back to MD Anderson on sabbatical and oh, spent 1979-80 right. uh, <coughs> back at MD Anderson mm. as a sort of returning fellow and was t tempted to actually stay in the United States but then went back, it was at the time when Stamey was uh, doing all the ultrasound guided uh, biopsy and McNeil had des described the, the anatomy of the prostate which mm. was very exciting and PSA had just arrived so it was a whole new ball game with prostate cancer, which um, I thought was a fantastic uh, turn of events. So I went back and then became head of the unit at St Vincent's and then subsequently was offered a job at the university. So you moved. This is, this is what I was going to ask you about. There, there, there was a, I think to put it mildly, there was a sort of a, a, a bit of a conflagration uh, uh, and, and you moved across uh, uh, yeah. to, to the Royal to, Melbourne. Yeah, Royal Melbourne and, offered me a job to be head of Urology, they wanted to, to change the direction of urology, yeah. not to put too fine a point on it. Just so. And um, and so I started there, which was affiliated with the University of Melbourne in 99, and have been there ever since, and really that's been um, yeah. fantastic. So, I mean, you you have now developed that, there's no question about it, and it's become, uh, you know, it's certainly one of the leading centres in the world in, in relation to, obviously, among other things, robotics. But we'll come, we'll come over to that in a minute. But tell us just... Um, from everybody's point of view, how did how did you bring that about? Um, identi ad identifying talent, I think, is and encouraging the younger guys. <clears throat> I think one of the problems I had at, at the same stage when I post fellowship, it was difficult to get an opportunity to flourish. Mm. And uh, one of the things uh, that's really motivated me is to see very talented young urologists uh, have an opportunity to, to display their their talents, and I think that's. Partly how I've established the Royal Melbourne. I've appointed about 11 new urologists there. Just if you could maybe tell us a little bit about your approach to the younger people. How do you get them to work for you? Well, look, when I have the discussion, and I have, I have had these discussions quite often over the years, when I, I think somebody could make a contribution, I ask them firstly how much money they want to make. And I say, you want to make two million? A year, or do you want to make a million a year, or is 500,000 enough, or whatever? I said, so I say, look, if you're going to get on this train, it's not going to make you a lot of money. You'll be very comfortable. I don't know a starving urologist, um, but there, there are opportunities, particularly in Australian urology, to make a lot of money. I think you know, it's a very flourishing private mm -hmm. practice, and the harder you work, the more remun rewarded you are. So, if people want to do um, above and beyond uh, private practice, they have to make some sacrifices, and I think people, some that resonates with some young neurologists. They want to do a bit more. They want to give back, and they want to innovate and uh, teach and publish. And I think the the guys who are able to write, I think that's an incredibly important asset or attribute. Write, think innovatively, um, and work hard in the, in the public service rather than just private practice. One of the things about your department is that obviously there's a big clinical practice. You've got a lot of contacts abroad, so you, you, I know you send your guys um, far and wide. What about the academic laboratory-based research? Where does that come in? Uh, when I went to Royal Melbourne, we had, uh, the, we had access to um, the University of 
basic science and uh, uh, there was no prostate cancer sir, research being done. So I had a guy called Neil Corcoran come by via yes. you. Yes. He knocked on my door. Yes. It really started with him because uh, Neil uh, had some health issues. So he started our lab and um, he is uh, up there with the brightest of the bright. Yeah. And uh, so he spent three years in the early 2000s doing a PhD in uh, the molecular biology and prostate cancer. And he, he then attracted a number of our scientists into a group. And then we were able to grow, uh, offer PhD scholarships, grow a laboratory, so as, which has now grown to the Australian Centre for Prostate Cancer Research, which is, which is federal government funded at our hospital. And uh, we have about 25 people working in the lab uh, in, in soft science and in basic science. So uh, Neil will head that up. He's finishing his fellowship in Vancouver with Martin Glebe and Larry Goldenberg. And when he comes back, he'll be the uh, head of our research. Right. It's a good well, story. So let me just ask you a little side, uh, a, a side question. That Irishness, you mentioned that you have an Irish background. How, how important is that to you? It's extremely important. I've emphasised with my kids, you've got to understand where you come from. And um, my uh, heritage is very uh, much in the, in the non-conservative side of politics. Um, uh, in, in Australia, in the Labor Party, not to get too political, but uh, you really need to understand your background. And I think the fact that we had to emigrate from Ireland, both my mother's side with the family and my father's side, and start from scratch um, in the mid-1800s, 18, uh, means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And then to go back so often as I have and to, uh, and then to yes, get the college... that has been acknowledged uh, yeah. by your getting an honorary fellow, yeah. fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. So. Uh, that's our, our biggest honour. So, I uh, think that was the high point of my career. I honestly yeah, do think yeah. that was the best uh, accolade I've ever had, and um, I'm very proud of it. And uh, it did all the paraphernalia adorned my wall in my office, um, and I've had letters from the Irish president, just uh, Christmas cards or whatever. So, um, no, that, it, it means a lot. The Irish, yeah, and my, you can see it in my own kids, they're very spirited, yeah. intelligent, uh, very facile with literature, which I think... Uh, is an Irish tray, and uh, they understand it, so they understand right. it. Tell me about the robot. Obviously, that's a, a, a significant part of your department, your, your own commitment to the robot, your commitment to training other people in it. I remember one of the doyens of urology in Sydney said to me about seven or eight years ago, why did I come to oncology so late? You know, it's apropos of the robot, well, I had to remind him that I did a fellowship in Emily Anderson before he was out of short pants, um, <laughs> but it's not a, uh, the robot really was just uh, to me just computerising the simple thing, computerising surgery, making it better for the surgeon and the patient. And I, I've always been inter interested in technology. I did the laser stuff in the mm. early 90s, and that was considered a bit avant-garde early, and then now it's mainstream. And the robot, I think the robot's about peaked, but. To me, I, I said to Justin Peters, who works with me and has for a long time, that if he didn't change to robotics, he wouldn't be doing any radical prostatectomies in five years. And I th that was fairly true. Mm. And it was prescient because whether you like it or not, and it was, hard, <clears throat> it was difficult for surgeons of your and my vintage to change when I was 53 or 54 mm. when I had to change to do robotics. Um, it was a painful change, mm. uh, but I think it was an absolutely necessary one. It's proved a great success in, um, I think, it, because it now enables us to become a high volume centre, mm. add that to our research, add it to tissue, uh, tissue banking and informatics, and has really um, internationalised us because we, we were early in the, in the process of changing to the changing technologies. When we think of Tony Costello, to pronounce it correctly, the, we think of a hard working, successful academic and clinical urologist. But, of course, there's another side, which is the, the side when one gets home, when one relaxes. Tell us about the sporting pursuits. Well, I, I wasn't a bad athlete in college terms. I was uh, captain of the swimming team, the football team, and I was um, drafted to the pro football uh, when I started uh, my first year at um, the university in med school. So I didn't have a car and I didn't have this, and I didn't think I was very bright, so I didn't play pro football. Uh, I played amateur, what we call amateur football for the university, 
and uh, I was pretty good at it. Um, and then when I finished football, I took up running um, because I was always pretty fit. So I ran marathons and ran, you know, 10Ks. And mm. I was reasonably quick, mm. believe it or not, because I'm mm. fairly big. But sport's been a huge thing in my life. And it was a, it's a huge thing for Irish people mm -hmm. in Australia because it was one way you could demonstrate yeah. your... Uh, your talent was to be uh, good. You'll notice in Australian sports teams there are a lot of Irish names, yeah. and uh, it's not an accident. Um, and so sport, and with my own kids, we are really we are immersed in sport. They've all been very very successful in different rowing, um, athletics, uh, football. Mm. So that's a huge thing. My yes. other interest is wine. Uh, by way of background, uh, when I was in my, I'd always had a desire to grow wine, and um, I had. Uh, a farm uh, when I was in my 30s I bought some land on the Mornington Peninsula and there were only two or three vineyards four vineyards I think at the time so I planted four acres of Chardonnay and with my brother Brian who's a head and neck surgeon and we grew it and we had bottled it and we sold it and it was quite successful but it became uh, difficult I was getting calls uh, to my office when I was seeing patients about restaurants want needing another dozen bottles of Chardonnay, and it became untenable. So I sold, I sold out of it. But wine, I think, is a fascinating in right. interest, and so um, on the consumer side of it, as you know. Mm. But uh, so I like it. everywhere I go, I look for wine. Now, what about things like literature and music? I read a lot. Oh, yeah, uh, read uh, in, uh, incessantly. Really, I, if I'm not um, reading. Journals. I'm reading li modern literature. Right. You know, Ian McEwan's and yeah, uh, that sort of ilk. So, any heroes? Say, let's 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 divide it. Let's have medical heroes and historical heroes. Uh, medical heroes. Well, Doug Johnson was the one I was yeah. talking about. John Blandy, of course. My father is a mm. is a dedicated general practitioner. My brothers who are doing very mm. well in pediatrics, head and neck surgery, anaesthesia. My brothers. Are, Tim's the head of uh, College of Sur Anesthesia Examiners. Uh, you know, they've done all very, very well. Um, uh, heroic people. Michael Collins was pretty heroic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, Mandela was, stands out uh, just above everybody else. And, as I went to uh, Robben Island, as you have, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, um, I, uh, I met Francois Pienaar in Dublin. Um, wow. Uh, he was a very nice, he's a super guy, and to see that movie with PNR and uh, Mandela Invictus was. Uh, so, he, if all the, if all the people I think uh, demonstrated uh, uh, the ability to survive under incredible duress, he'd be the one. He'd be the yeah. one. Yeah. So, um, just to, to sort of finish up, tell us um, what is in the future for you. I think about this every day, mm -hmm. pretty much now, I'm mm -hmm. sure you do too. Mm -hmm. The, what do you do if you've had a very full life in medicine? Do you, do you just go out suddenly or do you phase out? Or how do you, But um, I'm planning to do more in the cancer research mm -hmm. with the centre we've got. I'll still operate for another two or three years. Uh, I have very talented underlings. Um, and we've got two grandchildren who have just arrived. So I see a, a full life. I don't see myself out of medicine no, ever, really. No, yeah. sure not. Well, listen, Tony, what I can say is thank you very much. Uh, that's been a most enjoyable interview. Thanks, and it's been great fun just uh, talking to you about uh, yourself.